So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about prostate cancer and also about hydrogel rectal spacers. And you don't have to know what that is yet. I'm going to tell you all about it as we go. A um, little about me. So I spent a lot of time in school at UNC. Uh, and I've been doing a lot of stuff with space or as well. These rectal spacers um, been doing that those now for seven years. Um, and in fact, I started doing them about four months after they got FDA approval. And now I run one of three uh, space or centers of education in the country. So we train people who are interested in learning the procedure, how to place these hypergel rectal spacers. Uh, doctors come in or uh, as this company has grown, they've had to train a bunch of people to do these things. And so I, I participated in that training process. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about prostate cancer. We're going to start by looking a little bit at the anatomy because the anatomy is really important in terms of understanding why side effects happen. Um, we're going to talk about some just facts and figures related to prostate cancer, how we diagnose the disease, what are the treatment options, and then talk in a little more detail about radiation from the society. Okay, so a few facts and figures just about men's health in general. First of all, men don't live as long as women, it turns out, which I don't really like that fact, but it is the truth. Uh, in this country, the average age that a man lives, lives to is 76, and the average age that a woman lives to is 81. It doesn't seem fair, and yet there it is, okay? Now, <laughs> right <around. laughs> so, so, and that men have a higher death rate across the board for lots of things, including cancer, heart disease, diabetes, a whole wide array of other things. Um, men, it turns out, don't like to go see doctors. And maybe this has a little bit to do with it. And that is only about half as many uh, physician visits for preventive care are, uh, are done by men as by women. So in our avoidance, of doctors, we actually do ourselves a disservice. Now, oops, sorry, turns out actually also that men are less likely to have good health insurance than women are, and that may also contribute to the fact that we don't see doctors as much, and we maybe have more problems with these things, and then we maybe don't live as long. Um, in terms of prostate cancer, about 30,000 men die of prostate cancer in this country every year, okay? And that makes it the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States, the distant second to lung cancer, but it had a full rectal cancer. Uh, and so um, it's, it's a really important topic to understand. And so I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about it today. Um, first of all, about one out of every nine men in this country will develop prostate cancer, or I should say be diagnosed with prostate cancer at some time during his lifetime. About 165,000 men diagnosed with prostate cancer every year, and as I was saying, about 30,000 deaths. But what that tells you is that a lot of men who get diagnosed with prostate cancer don't die of the disease. And you can see it here also, the five-year relative survival uh, for localized cancer greater, greater than 99%, the five-year relative survival, 99%, 10-year relative survival for all stages, 98%. These are really, really high numbers. And what that tells you is that that means that there are a lot of men in this country who are living as prostate cancer survivors. Anyone want to take a guess as to how many men that might be? Oh, come on. You <laughs> No guess, sorry. Uh, turns out over 3 million, right? over 3 million men in this country are prostate cancer survivors. And what that means is that the side effects that you can get from treatment become really important because if you're going to spread that around in three million men, well, you better do what you can do to minimize those side effects. Okay, so first of all, how, how do you diagnose prostate cancer? Well, the most common way that we find prostate cancer these days is by screening. Um, the PSA is the most common way we do that. PSA stands for prostate-specific antigen, and it is actually very prostate-specific. 
But what it is not is prostate cancer specific. Okay, and this is one of the things that makes PSA a so-so tool for diagnosing prostate cancer. Prostate cancer does, by and large, make PSA, but then again, so does normal prostatic tissue. And so there are things that can inflame the normal prostate that can make a PSA go up really high and make us think that maybe somebody has cancer when in fact they don't. And there are a few patients who have really high grade, really bad cancers that have lost the ability to make PSA and those patients get underdiagnosed because their PSA may not even be out of the normal range, even though they have very dangerous disease. But at the moment, PSA is the best thing that we have. Also, we use digital rectal examination. <laughs> um, and, and that also is certainly less than perfect in terms of helping to diagnose prostate cancer. You can only palpate disease that's on the back part of the prostate. You can only do it really at the bottom of the prostate unless you have really long fingers. Um, and, and so either neither of these tools is perfect, but they're the best things that we have. And so we should make sure we use them. Now, this is how we diagnose most men with prostate cancer, because at this point, when they're getting their PSA checks, usually they are completely asymptomatic, even if they have cancer. They don't have urinary symptoms. They're not having bleeding anywhere. They don't have pain anywhere. Most men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer have no symptoms of that disease whatsoever. When we do find that in non-screen detected situations, because they have pain, because they have urinary symptoms, because they have bleeding or other things like that, usually we're dealing with a quite advanced disease already at that point. So, uh, so the screening sort of shifts away from that. We're screening well, we don't see a lot of those non-screen detected prostate cancers. Now, if we are going to then diagnose the disease, we don't diagnose it just based on the PSA and the digital rectal examination. It's actually based on biopsy, okay? You have to see cancer under the microscope to know that you actually have cancer. There, so let's talk a little bit about anatomy and then we're gonna talk about biopsy of the prostate. So you can see the prostate here, which I'm gonna pretend I have a pointer. All right, so it's in a really sensitive place, right? Right in the middle of the pelvis, just below the bladder, the urethra runs right through the middle of it, and the rectum sits literally one or two millimeters behind it. So this location is what creates problems for men who are getting treated for prostate cancer. Okay, so let's let's go ahead and look at um, biopsies. Okay, now by far the most common way that biopsies are done in, in this country, actually throughout the world, is with this transrectal approach, okay? The transrectal approach, you have a, a rectal probe, goes in here, you visualize the prostate with that, and it's got a little guide there for a needle, and that needle kind of slides through there, and then you can poke it right through the rectal wall and into the prostate, okay? Typically, you will do a 12 core biopsy, meaning you get 12 samples, so put 12 holes through the rectal wall into the prostate. Now, as a radiation oncologist, anytime we're doing anything with prostate and radiation oncology, we try not to go through the rectal wall like this. And instead, we go through this area of skin called the perineum. Now, the perineum has the advantage of being able to be sterilized and then a needle can be placed through that space and into the prostate with a much lower risk of infection. But urologists have always been trained to do it with the transrectal approach. The problem with that is we have quite high rates of sometimes very serious infections that are caused by that virus. So these days there is a, the beginning of a shift toward thinking about the use of a transperineal approach instead of a transrectal approach. We have data that certainly tells us that the infection rates are much, much lower for this approach than doing transrectally, but getting the entire community of physicians to change what they do is a slow process. 
so right now, only about 6% of prostate biopsies are actually done transperineally, the other 94% are done transrectally. Is the diagnosis is good with this metric versus that method? In fact, it is better. Um, and the question was, is the diagnosis as good with this with the transperineal approach as it is with the transrectal approach? It turns out you can map the prostate better this way because when you do a transrectal approach, it's hard to get the needle all the way to the front of the prostate. So you're getting a good sampling at the back of the prostate, but a very inadequate sampling usually at the front of the prostate, especially in a patient that has a large gland. With this approach where you're coming from underneath, you're actually mapping it as you go, and you're able to sample from the front of the prostate just as well as you sample from any other part of the prostate. Did you cover this? Well, so that's something that is sort of in evolution now, and that's a, that's a great question and a good point, and that is that a lot of times things in the world of medicine are dictated by what's covered and what's not covered, and it has to sort of gain a critical mass of enough um, enthusiasm behind it and enough of a drive by physicians and by patients in order to get those things to change. Now, there are some new ways of doing this, Like you can get coverage for doing both of them equally, but there are devices that are used for doing the transperineal approach that are a little bit different. And so uh, that can create some uh, obstacles at this point. So how does the MRI infusion guided biopsy differ from you? Yeah, so, so the MRI, so the question is, how does an, uh, a fusion biopsy differ from this? And a fusion biopsy, typically what you're doing is taking an MRI image set and fusing an ultrasound to that in real time so that if there are nodules or abnormalities within the prostate, you can actually navigate needles out to those nodules and make sure that you've sampled them well. Most commonly these days, though, what is done is a transrectal approach where you're basically taking a, a sampling of 12 cores that are taken two from each sextant. That is, if you look at the prostate as an upside down pyramid, you split down the middle and you divide it in thirds this way, you take two cores from each of those six areas. That's what is typically done for biopsy. But definitely an improvement on that is the fusion biopsy that you're talking about. The problem is that you have to get an MRI first before you can do the biopsy, and a lot of uh, th there can be some obstacles again in coverage to get that MRI covered, which is a fairly expensive uh, study, in order to have that. But I agree with you, that's a really good way of doing these. Typically, for that, they do that 12 core biopsy just like they would normally do, and then they oversample those nodules using that approach, either with something called Artemis or another one called Euronad. These are just two companies that, that basically are, are doing the same kind of thing, but those are very good biopsies. All done right now transrectally, but the Euronav um, biopsy is starting to be able to do that with this transperineal approach as well. Okay, so how do you know how serious prostate cancer is? All right. In a lot of other cancers, we touch, talk about stage one, stage two, stage four, whatever, right? But in prostate cancer, usually we're thinking about localized disease versus disease that is distant or disseminated elsewhere in the body. And then within the localized disease, we divide things into risk categories. How dangerous is this cancer for that patient? Low risk, intermediate risk, high risk, okay? And those risk categories are based on three factors. One, the PSA, which is the blood test. Two, a combination of the physical examination of the prostate, whether there are any lumps, bumps, nodules, and also any imaging studies that have been done, like an MRI or something like that, that might tell us more about, about what is happening locally within the prostate. Then also, the Gleason score. Now, the Gleason score is basically a measure of how aggressive the cancer looks under the microscope. So the pathologist gets this stuff, uh, all these 12 cores or however many cores there are, mounts them on slides, and then looks at them to ask, one, is there cancer in any individual sample? And 
within that sample, if there's cancer, how dangerous does it look? How much of the core is cancer versus normal prostate and so forth? So the combination of those things, PSA, physical examination and imaging studies, along with Gleason score, help us to put these cancers into those risk categories. And the risk categorization helps us to figure out what's reasonable to do about the cancer. Um, we use now also a few other factors to some extent, uh, things like how fast the PSA is going up, how much it's gone up in, you know, say over the course of one year, how quickly it doubles. So there are a variety of different ways of measuring how fast the PSA is changing. We look at some genetic uh, markers within prostate. So there's something called Polaris. There's another one called the Cipher. There's one called Oncotype. These things are all different ways of looking at genetic mutations within the cancer. To ask the question, hey, are these influencing how dangerous this cancer is? Okay, actually, you can go to the next one. All right, so this is kind of a busy slide, and uh, I'll I'll try and make some sense of it for you, but. Um, once somebody has been diagnosed with prostate cancer, we have to ask the question, how should we manage this? And prostate cancer is really different from most other cancers in that our first question is, should we watch it or should we treat it? Most other cancers, you know, they just say, all right, you've got this cancer, here's how we treat it, and then you just do that. With prostate cancer, you ask that first question, watch it versus treat it, and then after that, if you're going to treat it, there are a bunch of different ways of doing that. And so it makes it a really difficult disease to figure out what exactly is the right thing to do. All right, so in terms of active surveillance, um, this is generally something that is used for men who have either low risk cancer or even maybe an intermediate risk cancer, especially as they age. So men say over the age of 80, a men who uh, have lots of other comorbid illnesses. So if, if, if I have a patient who comes in dragging an oxygen tank and he's got a suitcase full of medications and he's got an intermediate risk cancer, I'm thinking, hey, let's watch this thing because we're all mortal and something's going to get this guy before this cancer to the problem for him. I have other 80 year olds who come in and I'm like, I want to be that guy when I'm 80. And those guys need treatment because they're going to live most likely long enough that the cancer can be very problematic for them. Now, still for a low risk cancer, for almost anyone at any age, a low risk cancer, it is usually reasonable to observe. Now, how we observe has changed over time. It used to be ah, every now and then you check PSA, see what it's doing. But the problem was in being that lax about it, a lot of times things would get out of control while you weren't watching, and that's a really bad problem. These days, when we do what's called active surveillance, it's a much more involved program. So typically, checking the PSA every three to six months, repeating a biopsy and a year out from the initial biopsy, and then making decisions from there about how frequently you should continue to do that based on any changes. Uh, but you need to be really involved in that process in order to make sure that things won't uh, go off the rails while you weren't looking. Now, Surgery, let's, okay, so let's say that we decide we do need to treat. What are the ways that we can do that? Well, the most common way that we treat prostate cancer in this country is with an operation called a radical prostatectomy. Now, the radical prostatectomy removes the prostate, several vesicles, sometimes lymph nodes, and sometimes not. Um, these days, it is most commonly done with what we call robot assistance, okay? That is, uh, using a special kind of robot that allows the, the surgeon to be over like, you know, on the other side of the room from the patient, playing a video game, seemingly, at least the radiologist, that's what it looks like. Uh, <laughs> and what he's doing is actually, you know, manipulating these arms that are outside of the patient that have all these devices inside of the patient that, uh, that can remove the prostate. It's really remarkable, actually. Um, and this is a, a great way of treating prostate cancer, but it's not for everyone, okay? The issues with surgery tend to be related to problems with urinary leakage and incontinence, and these are very age-dependent issues. So 
That is to say, young men do great with surgery. They bounce back quickly. They they do really well with it. But as men age, especially past age 70, those side effects tend to be more and more. So if you operate on an 80-year-old man, he is very highly probably going to have urinary incontinence. If you operated on the same guy when he was 60, he would probably, he'd probably do great. Okay. Um, so we have to be careful about that with surgery. But surgery is a very good way of treating prostate cancer. And it's not a radiation oncologist. I can tell you that. The second most common way that we treat prostate cancer in this country is radiation. And there are other ways of treating prostate cancer, and they're kind of beyond the scope. We'll, we'll run into a three-hour talk instead of a one-hour talk. So uh, I'm not going to discuss those today, but if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to field questions on those as well. Okay, and one more. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, uh, I'm not going to mention too much about what radiation is, but let's just say most commonly when we are treating with radiation, we are using high energy X rays that are focused and directed at the prostate, and they deliver a high dose of radiation to that area. Um, these are much the same kind of X rays that are used when you get a chest X ray or a CT scan. They're higher energy, but just like you can't feel it when you get a chest X ray, you can't feel it when you get radiation. But as we're going to talk about, just because you can't feel it doesn't mean there are no side effects in treatment. There are certainly the, the possibility of side effects, and, and most commonly those deal with bowel and urinary related issues. Okay, so in terms of just trying to make sense of radiation and what the radiation options are, I'm going to try and make it fairly simple. That is, broadly speaking, there are two ways of delivering radiation. External beam radiation, which you can think of as radiation from the outside. In. You're lying on a treatment table, there's a machine that moves around here, it's delivering high energy radiation directed at your prostate. The other way of doing it is internal radiation, something called brachytherapy. Uh, brachytherapy is where you place the radiation sources directly into whatever you're trying to treat. And the most, most common example of that in the world of prostate cancer is something called a prostate seed implant. A prostate seed implant, you place somewhere 80 to 100 little radioactive capsules into the prostate permanently. And they give off their radiation over a number of months, and it's actually a very effective way of treating prostate cancer. And in fact, back when it was first really developed in its modern form in the early 1980s, it was really the only way to deliver a high dose of radiation to the prostate and effectively get rid of cancer. External beam radiation, we had the problem of really not knowing where the prostate was and not being able to target it very well. And so, and we knew there was probably some other stuff in there that was, you know, that didn't really appreciate radiation. And so we were really limited in what we could do because of the potential side effects of treatment. Um, but over the years, we've gotten much better at delivering radiation therapy in terms of our technology. That is, that we can image things now and see things that we couldn't before. We can target in ways that we couldn't. We can actually track things in real time in ways that we could not before. And so we've been able to drive that radiation dose up much, much higher with the use of external beam radiation. And in fact, as a result of that, the use of seed implants has actually fallen off quite a lot over the last decade or so. We also have a more modern version of that, something called HDR breaking therapy, high dose rate breaking therapy. So seeds are what we call NLDR, low dose rate breaking therapy. They give off their radiation over a number of months. High dose rate breaking therapy gives off its radiation in a single outpatient treatment that lasts about 30 minutes. Okay, so a lot of radiation given at one time, but very effective. And in fact, you can tailor that dose a little bit better than you can tailor a seed implant. And so in our practice, we don't actually do seed implants anymore. We do HDR green therapy now instead. But we don't actually do it as what we call monotherapy, that is, as the sole means of treating a prostate cancer. We use it as an adjunct, as an addition to external beam radiation for our uh, high-risk patients, our, our patients who have really bad prostate cancer. In general, 
for our patients who have disease that is lower risk that we want to treat with radiation, we treat them. So as opposed to the conventional radiation course, which was giving a little bit every day over a bunch of days, and it got to the point where we're talking about nine weeks of daily treatment, Monday through Friday, so 45 radiation treatments. We now use a very compressed treatment schedule that is five treatments. Okay, so instead of 45 treatments, it's five treatments. Turns out that works at least as well as the nine week treatment course. And if anything, with less side effects than that long treatment course. So for our low risk, favorable intermediate risk patients, and sometimes even our unfavorable intermediate risk patients, we use that treatment course very, very frequently. Okay, works great. Patients like it because they're in and out very quickly um, and, and it has very tolerable side effects. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to talk about proton therapy today. That, that sort of warrants an entire discussion uh, unto itself. But let's just say proton therapy is only available at certain very specialized centers. Uh, there is not one in North or South Carolina. Uh, there's a new one at Emory. There's one in Jacksonville, Florida. There's there's a few others within a, a moderate drive of us, but not any place that if you had to go there for 40 treatments would be very convenient unless you just often move to that place for a couple of months. Okay, so this is showing you a couple of images of a pelvis, okay? This one is what we call an axial view. That's a patient cut through the middle like this. This other one is what we call a sagittal view. That's cut down the middle this way, okay? Now, here you're, you're looking at radiation doses. Now, first of all, these are little tracking markers that are placed into the prostate. That's what those little shiny things are. Um, and then around that, you can see uh, in red, high dose of radiation, and then as it gets bluer, it's lower and lower doses of radiation. Um, and what you can see here is this is the rectum, okay? And what we see is there's a fair amount of that front part of the rectum that is getting radiation, okay? Now, if you look at it from a side view, you can see again, this is the rectum here. This whole area is getting a, a pretty significant amount of radiation. And in fact, this is the bladder. The bladder is also getting a fair amount of radiation. The urethra runs right through the middle of the prostate, so there's no avoiding radiation to the urethra. In fact, you can avoid putting what we call hot spots there. That is giving a really high dose that might give it give more long-term urinary complications. So, uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about issues related to the fact that the rectum is right behind the prostate, okay? As I was saying before, literally one to two millimeters separating the prostate and the rectum. When we treat with radiation, we always treat with a margin around whatever we're treating. And the reason for that margin in, in the world of prostate cancer is you can have a little bit of disease that has gotten through the capsule of the prostate. You want to make sure you've covered that. There can be a little, little differences in setup from one day to the next. There can be a little bit of swelling in the prostate that makes the gland a little bit bigger from one day to the next and so forth. So if you don't build in a margin, you're likely to miss some of the disease. So you have to build in that margin. The problem is that if you build in a margin to the back of the prostate, you're going to build it into the front wall of the rectum. And it turns out rectums don't appreciate that. <laughs> so um, one of the things, actually, if, oh, actually stay on this one and then we'll go back to the other. Okay, so this is something called space horn. Okay, space horn is a water-based gel that can be placed into the space between the prostate and the rectum. And what it does is just, if this is prostate and this is the front of the rectum, it just physically moves them away from each other. So that when we build in that margin around the prostate, we're not building it into the front wall of the rectum the way we were previously. So that causes a significant decrease in the radiation dose received by the rectum and it decreases side effects related to that. So go back to the, the one before that. Okay, so this actually shows us for patients getting that short treatment course that I was telling you about, the difference in gastrointestinal side effects for those in blue who were using that space or gel versus the ones uh, in gray who were not. And you can see 
about 6% of patients getting significant gastrointestinal problems associated with that treatment versus 1% among the patients who got that gel spacer. And then if, even if you look at the genital urinary side effects, that's, you know, problems with urinary urgency, leakage, and so forth, that it's about half what it is for those with, so th those who got the gel have about half that rate as the patients who didn't get the gel. Now, you might say, well, it's not anywhere near the latter, so how in the world does it have any impact on the amount of problems that people have as far as urinary function? Well, it turns out a lot of what we have to do in radiation oncology is to try to spare what we call organs at risk, that is the sensitive things that are nearby the thing that we're trying to treat. And radiation has to come in somehow and has to exit somehow. And so if you have a lot of trouble meeting your constraints on the rectum, a lot of dose is going to get kind of forced somewhere else. And one of the places it gets forced is into the bladder. And so what we see is that the dose, and we've seen this in our own data, the dose of radiation that is received by the bladder is much higher for patients who didn't get a gel spacer versus those who did get one. So sort of, it, it, you know, even though it's not directly impacting the bladder, it does impact our ability to spare the bladder and therefore indirectly makes it so that we can do a better job of protecting that area. Okay, so we can hike. So, I've been telling you a little bit about this hydrogel space orb. Um, so again, you, if you see over here, the, the, the prostate, and then around it is that additional margin that's built in around, okay? And you see that margin being built right into that front wall of the rectum. This definitely can impact things in terms of quality of life, right? You can wind up with bleeding issues, you can wind up with uh, issues related to bowel control. You can, in worst case scenario, get ulcer formation in the rectal wall that can become a hole that then requires big operations and so forth. So it's a really important thing to try to reduce that radiation dose. Okay, so let's... Um, now, this shows you the, the same thing with that gel spacer in place where the radiation dose is no longer in the rectal wall. And so now this um, gel spacer has been formulated to be very stable for about three months. And it was formulated that way because uh, at the time that it was first formulated, a lot of these radiation courses were eight, nine weeks long. So they wanted to make sure that it would, from, from the time you start planning to the time you finish the treatment, it was stable. And then it will just slowly dissolve over time. And it's just excreted in the urine. Um, it's only 10 cc, so it's a very small volume, and it takes several months for it to go away, but you, you don't even notice it going away. And then if you, if you got an MRI or CT, uh, you know, a year after it was placed, it just wouldn't be there anymore. Um, okay, and, now, and this stuff is made out of something called polyethylene glycol PEG, um, which is used in lots of other things. Uh, we use it in brain surgery to fill cavities. We use it in, you know, we know that it's safe from many years of using it in all, all kinds of different places within the body and having it basically not be problematic. Um, now, uh, the, the procedure itself, I haven't really told you about that a lot. My patients, when I tell them about space or they, they, they look at me and they go, how do you get that thing in there? <laughs> Which is a great question. Uh, it's not in, entirely obvious. So um, basically the patient, uh, and I do this uh, by the way with patients uh, under conscious sedation, all right? Uh, you can do it under local anesthesia uh, and, and for patients who can't be under, under any anesthesia, we do that. You can do it under general anesthesia, but we do it under like a colonoscopy sedation, you know, conscious sedation. Patient's legs are up in stirrups, ultrasound probe, uh, in, in the rectum, just like the one that's used for biopsies. Um, and then you take an 18 gauge needle and you place it into the space. I see people wincing. <laughs> You're asleep, okay? Uh, so uh, you, you place it into the space. <laughs> so through, through that area of skin called the perineum, again, that we looked at before when we were looking at biopsies, you place that needle into the space between the prostate and the rectum. 
and then you uh, it starts as two liquids in a double barrel syringe. You push it through a wide adapter, it immediately becomes a soft solid gel in that space. So it works very, very well, is, is very low in impact in terms of procedures. I mean, no scalpels, no stitches. Uh, patients <laughs> the next day are basically back to all normal activities. So that does great. Um, it's been studied, uh, and, and, and we'll look at in a minute at, at one of those studies, but not in great detail. I'm just going to hit the, the super high points. We make sure. How am I doing on time? <laughs> Still doing okay. All right, let's next one. Okay, so the clinical trial that led to FDA approval for the, this hydrogel spacer basically showed us uh, that not only did it decrease rectal complications, but again, as I said, it improved urinary function. It resulted, believe it or not, in, in less erectile dysfunction issues. And again, this has to do with our improved ability to spare normal structures. So there are certain areas, especially vascular structures, that can be problematic if treated to a high dose of radiation regarding erectile function. And so if you can spare those areas better because of this gel spacer, then you actually wind up with improvements in erectile function as well. Or I should say improvements, I will say less decrement in, in uh, erectile function. And overall, if you look at uh, patient reported outcomes, that is where you ask the patient, how are you doing? Instead of asking the doctor, well, how's your patient doing? Because it turns out doctors don't really know that much. Um, but if you ask them about quality of life, what they say is that their quality of life, if you look at the group that got the spacer versus that that didn't, the group that got it had long-term better quality of life with regard to all of these domains and in terms of what they perceive to be their overall quality of life. So there's a lot of publications on this. Uh, and, and, and as I said, you know, they, they got the approval in 2015, so that's growing now. Uh, at least 50,000 men worldwide who have received this. It is now reimbursed by Medicare. It was not until about 2018 or so, but in so the last four years, it's gotten Medicare approval. Um, and it's used in a, in a lot of major cancer centers now around the country. Uh, and again, we, we've been doing this a long time, and I do a lot of teaching on this particular topic. And again, as we talked about before, 3 million men in this country are prostate cancer survivors. And so, even if you have a small percent of those patients have significant problems with uh, with these side effects, multiply that by three million men, and you're looking at a large number who have significant problems. And so, whatever we can reasonably do to reduce those that, that number, I think it's it's our obligation to do that. And, and this is one of the ways that we found uh, we can be very successful in helping to minimize those side effects. 